Well, we've got one more back of the candidate coming in on Monday. Talks on 10 o'clock in the morning. I'm at, I guess, 3, three o'clock for the session for students to interact with them. And let's see, we're, the world is closing on us. Um, Facebook just announced they're canceling their annual conference because of virus concerns. Okay. Microsoft, um, they pulled out of a, another conference. Northern Italy is asking schools to close down. We'll see if we make it to the semester without San Diego State being closed down the virus. So it's time for people, if they haven't already, to apply for an AWS Educate account. Sometimes it can take them a long time to get back to you. Yeah, it varies. Um, you know, last year some students waited weeks. I don't know if they did something wrong or I mean, you expect it all to be automated, right? Just create an account, the red ID, whatever they want, and then click and they like, done. I just want to confirm, all we need to do is make an AWS Educate account and get inside of Yes, that's that's a starting point. Right, right, right. And I, they will want you to create a um, Amazon Web Services account as part of that process. You need to connect that up to the AWS account so that when you actually run something, it, it charges that instead of your credit card. <coughs> So um, I was hoping to get your next assignment out by today, but I didn't make it. So this weekend, uh, and we'll talk about clustering, and then we'll start going on to Spark. Um, and so clustering is a common technique and it's unsupervised in the sense that we don't have to specify what the answer is. Um, and it's a way of this was how do we associate data points together in some way. Um, and there's all kinds of applications for this. Um, <coughs> automatic kind of sequence genes and see which ones are close to each other. Um, marketing does this all the time, right? How do we, we want to identify different types of customers so we can target them with, you know, as appropriate to them. Um, when you ever go on, when you go on to Amazon now, we're always big sites are like, we recommend for you this, right? So how do we identify, right? What group you belong to to figure out what you might want, or once you bought this thing, what's a group associated with that? Um, and yeah, recommendation systems, right? Just how do we you know, given the fact that you listen to these end songs, what do we recommend you can do next, right? 
Um, yeah, typically, we measure in distance, right? Um, but the problem is, what, what do we mean by distance? And you know, normalizing the data different ways to detect the distance. Um, here's a, you know, one library of distance specific type of distance we can do. We're most familiar with Euclidean, right? You just start here, maybe with the distance, but you know, city block distance, why well, you have to only go. So there's all kinds of different distances we can use. Um, you know, so it's cosine distance, Hamming distance. Um, and normalization can affect it. Um, there's different types of ways we can normalize data. Um, the min max is, you know, what's the range, right? Um, and it's just, you divide, right, the, the value, subtract off the minimum, and divide by the range, and that's going to map it from zero to one, right? Um, and it's, it's very easy to compute, very cheap, inexpensive. Um, <clears throat> the problem is, um, you know, if this is our data, you know, that's slightly larger than everything else. So when you map it, right, it compresses everything else down. And then when you get out something really large, now this data is really compressed, right? So outliers really, really affect, um, affect it. Um, you know, mean standard deviation, so we find a mean, we subtract it out from the value and divide by the standard deviation, and that, um, you know, pretty much in a range of minus 33, but outliers can, Go beyond it, um, but it's not as bad, right? So again, the same sequence. That's the outlier, um, and again, it's it's not quite as compressed, but it's starting to be fairly compressed, right? Um, you know, here. Yeah, so this is, it handles outliers a little better, right? It doesn't necessarily, um, and here again, well, it's just, the curve is pretty flat each end, so it's, these outliers don't really compress the data um, as much. You get this curve, right, and that curve goes way, way out there, and it maps most of that stuff off the same value. So it allows you to be very selective in that middle range, and then the outer range is not very selective. Uh, a very similar one, logistic function, um, has two parameters, and again, it's it's one of these curves, right, that um, allows you to be selective in, in that middle range, and then towards the end, they also get mapped together. Um, and this is, you know, this is used quite commonly, so the neural networks tend to use it um, in training to deal with these outliers. So, okay, well, we only want to focus in on this mid range. And um, if you're a sporting fan, um, there's probably not too many people in computer science that are big on sports. Um, but the ELO rating system uses this logistic curve to improve the ranking. Um, and again, it, these outliers don't affect the data so much because again, you get that curve that flattens out the ends. Um, and again, 
2000 doesn't really affect it much. Now, since we have these two parameters, right, again, we can start filling with them to figure out which one, you know, how far do we want that middle range to accomplish. Um, right, so as right, k gets larger, right, we're getting more and more of that middle range. All right, so this depends on, so we can, we can play with these parameters to figure out, you know, what range, how sensitive we want to be at various spots. The soft max is, again, we get a range between 0 and 1, um, and the mean is in the middle, which is sort of nice. Um, and with that standard deviation of the mean, it's pretty linear, and then ends get um, collapse on the same values. All right, so you know, that twenty does have an effect, um, and that two thousand does have an effect, not as much as previously. Now again, this is you know sort of covering machine learning course and three lectures. So we will skip over a few details. Um, like I said before, I'm hoping to you know, in the future be able to say, look, go we'll take the machine learning course, those courses, and then we can just say, okay, you already know all this stuff more than I do, so. We'll just go on to the tools. Um, yeah, text normalization, um, worry about stem words. Um, you know, we've looked at vectors before, there's various but other ways we can measure distance for text. Um, Jacquard index, um, you know, looking at two sets, right? You basically look at the intersection, size of the of a union, um, and then you just one minus that. And you can then use that as another way of figuring out how far words are apart from each other or sentences. And once we do that, now we can apply a clustering algorithm on the field. Because all these sentences, they have now become how far apart they are, now we can join the clusters to try and, okay, these sentences have somehow related, these are going to be, right? Is there any criteria to use any object, to choose any object, kind of like the one like Because uh, when, when we learn statistics, we know that the regular at the main standard deviation method, they can always help us to make the mean to be zero and right. the standard deviation to be one. But using the other method, we don't know whether it is good choice. Yeah, and that's you know, the good news is they haven't automated that yet, which means that people are okay to figure that out. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the problem. Is um, trying to figure out which um, is appropriate for your particular application. And part of it is you know, how much, how many outliers do you have, how far out there are you? Know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's, if you find a more detailed answer, you need the full semester length of course. Um, and again, we can, we, can, we can use vectors, the text, and then we can use that as a distance, how far apart they are. Um, right, we've seen this before. 
and the key. Um, you know, convert strings into canonical vectors, and then we're going to do a regular distance. Um, The cosine distance is often used because um, what happens if you have two vectors that are basically the same, but one ends here and then one ends over here, they're in the same direction, and so they probably just have the same set of words, but more words occur more frequently. Um, so using the cutting distances may not be appropriate. So the cosine distance is basically. Um, You know, when the angle is basically zero, it becomes one, and when the angle is 45, it becomes zero, um, and then when it's opposite, it becomes negative one. Yeah, you know, so here, you know, again, turning the vectors with it. The cosine distance. Um, yeah, I mean these two sentences are nothing to do with each other, right? And so the cosine distance is zero. Um, you know these are. They both have love and music, so they're close together. So the cosine distance is closer to zero. Um, So that overview. Now we can talk about clustering, but now we have a, we can talk about distance, right? Um, right. So, ten years neighbor k means and the DB scan are sort of really common clustering algorithms. Um, So the K-clustering idea is very simple. Um, is you basically assume that there's going to be K-clusters. How do you know there's going to be K-clusters? Well, you have to look at the data and try and figure that out, right? Um, and then you pick sort of K random spots, and then you like, okay, let's look at all the points close to each one of those. Um, And then, of course, you probably haven't picked the right spots, and so you've got clusters from where to um, readjust those gate points and try again and iterate over and over again until things become stable. Um, so, the K means what you do is okay, we, we pick those K points. Um, and for each point, we assign it to the that that cluster which is closest to the center um, using the distance, um, and then we can compute the mean for each cluster, um, and then we can use those as next iteration. You know, so if we have a bunch of, we pick point, you know, like k minus one points over here, and then the k point has to be over here, right? This cluster is going to be huge, and you know, we have all this add over here, right? And so we could do the mean and then move that point over here, and these things, right? Uh, it might move over here, and so then we readjust point to here, get that point over there, and the iterate all many times until so eventually. Hopefully, the iteration converges to a solution. All right, so here's an example that I stole from some text. I shall say, here's all data points, so we're going to pick these three, right, as a just mean, and then we divide them in the clusters based upon distance, 
and now we compute the mean of each cluster, right? Um, and so this mean goes over here, you know, this mean moves up and this mean moves down, and then we recompute, right? And now the points move different cluster, and we repeat that. And so people do it different ways. Um, the K means is you, you form initial clusters and you can put the mean of all those points. Um, Medioids is well, you pick the median point, right? Um, the point that's closest to the center, but has to be point in the data. Um, and and the The one advantage of this over the K means is that we know that the, the, the centers we pick from the cluster are always going to be part in the data that we know, right? In our data set, we can mean it's going to be some random point, um, which means now we can use any distance metric we want um, because we can compute it from. We have all we we know all our data points, right? Um, and so there's all kinds of examples. So this is again um, the R data set has this um, data set and when we pick k mean to be k equals three, um, you know it does a pretty good job. You know we can ask the question, you know, should that point actually be red or should it be blue? Right, this put on the border. Uh, but for you know maybe a few points on the border, we might have some questions. But otherwise, it's like. We got it right, right? Um, pick the initial mean. Um, of course, the, the better you pick, right, the faster is going to converge. Um, number of clusters. That's a much harder problem to them. If it's 2D data, then we really don't need a clustering algorithm to map these in the clusters, right? You know, it'd be nice to be able to have an algorithm to that. Of course, um, we start adding more data points, and it starts coming up here, it's not clear what to do, but if it's 3D data, then we've got some hope of you know visualizing it. 4D data, forget it, right? 5D, 6D. Yeah. Mention how the clusters are. Okay, that's something you know. We have mathematicians, statisticians. They can like okay, we let's come up with some sort of metric to figure out. All these are clustered or not. Um, and then we'll worry about how to normalize data, um, what, what measure of distance should be used. Um, so, the same data set, um, picking k equals 2. Well, I mean, what are you going to do, right? I mean, there's clearly three clusters, and you said I only want two, so. Two of them get mushed together. Um, you know, it's hard to see here, but it, it divided one cluster in half, right? Um, when you want five clusters, it, it took two of them and divided them in half. Um, you know, and doing it is six different times, you get different 
depending upon the initial data point, you'll end up converging to different points. Um, the algorithm is, is quite happy to take that, that cluster clearly and divide into pieces if you want more clusters. Like I said, it's 2D. I mean, we can clearly look at and reject it, but 5D. I mean, And of course, it's an algorithm, right? So no matter what data you give it, you say, give me n clusters, it's going to give you n clusters. Um, you know, it doesn't do very well in this data set because it's doing it by distance, right? Um, clearly, you really want the inner one to be a cluster and the outer one to be a cluster. But if you're doing it by distance, um, you're never you're never going to do that because um, these points are really far away from that point, and these points are much closer to that point, right? Um, so it starts doing things like this, dividing and and the pieces the wrong way. And then, oh yeah, and now what are you going to do, right? I mean, again, it's visually it's clear that there's two weird shaped clusters somehow related, right? Um, but if you start the clustering algorithm, right, this point is much closer to these points than it is to those points, right? And all of this stuff, this stuff, is this, is there something, have we squashed the data in two dimensions when it should be three dimensions or more and we're getting um, some artifact? Um, yeah, and you start doing this and you get, um, right? Yeah, so they make the assumption that, right, each cluster is centered around some sort of point. The clusters are convex, right? Um, and you, you have an idea how many clusters there should be. You know, we, we can try the spectral clustering from Speculate Learn. Um, and it does a better job on non convex clusters. This is a famous problem in all optimization issues. Um, <clears throat> if, whoops, if we're looking for um, if we want a program to find a, the maximum and minimum of this line, um, naive approach would be pick a point and then look at the slope of the line and then go up, right? Um, the problem is if we start here, we would then go up when we hit here, and we'd, we would reach that local maximum and we would never, right, move around. Um, so 
So one solution to this problem is you do it over and over again by picking different random points or you introduce randomness um, in the algorithm so that you don't always just try and go up. Um, The DB span works on a completely different process than the K means. Um, it looks for groups that are, are tightly packed together. Um, it's not quite as easy to explain as K means. K means is pretty straightforward. Um, so we've got several. Um, parameters. Um, we define a minimum number of points we want to be in a cluster. So, right, so the point is a core point if there are that many points within a given distance of that point, right? That is basically we want a bunch of stuff close to it, right? Um, so we specify what, how many need to be close and what close means. Um, so a reachable point, so if we're within that close distance of a point, we can reach it, right? These are the close neighbors. Um, now, Q is visual from P, if we can find a path from P1 to P2 to P3 and a Q, right? But the difference is we have to be directly reachable from P1 to from P plus 1 to from P, right? So we start at one point and we can then move to any one of the really close neighbors and then we can look at that one and we can move really close to any really close neighbors, right? So we can sort of move along as long as we are always going to something in that close neighbor within that given distance. Um, And an outlier is any point that's not reachable from that given any other point. Um, and you form a cluster by looking at the core point and then looking at all the points and then reach from that, right? And so then you can just, then the algorithm comes up, find all the core points, and then start, start at one, and you start traversing and grab it, you know, get that, get that bigger and bigger, and when you can't reach any more points, then you pick another core point and do the same thing. Um, right, so an example, right, so, um, You know, if we start at A, right, well, there's, here's, here's A, and there's one, two, three, there's four points, so these are all reachable from A, are, right, reachable by directly reachable. Um, this point has got four points, so if we start here, we can go there, right, and now, um, this point has four points, so we can reach there, and so we can go from A to B, no problem, right? So A and B are basically connected. Um, now we can, you know, the, the, that's one of the four points in A's radius. So we can come here and look at this this circle centered here, and there's four points there, and see if we can get there, right? But we we can't get to N because there's no. You know, so then this will become one cluster, and that's an outlier. So 
So we have to figure out, you know, that that what distance is close and how many points you want. Um, and the nice thing is, then you don't care about the menu. We don't have to know is there one cluster, two clusters, or five clusters. Um, so that's nice, right? It's like okay, it will tell us how many clusters are there. Um, and if you got crazy outliers, it's fine. It's not kind of you know. If you, and K means you pick one of those outliers to start with. It's going to do crazy things. It's way over there and um, really fast. Problems are, um, you know, if the data has different densities. So if, you know, this set of data is really dense, and we bunch of data over here, but not quite as dense. The problem is we pick, you know, distance, number of points based on this density. When we hit over here, it's like, well, I'm sorry, but these points are too far apart, right? So they get lost. Um, that becomes a problem. And, well, you know, when you're in a 50 dimensional space, it's really, really big, right? Um, and so then distance becomes a problem because it's staying directly to get farther. Um, you know, so the DB scan of the crazy data set, you know, we pick, you know, how the epsilon and then the number of points. Um, and we're pretty much getting those three clusters, but we're getting a few outliers we just can't reach because the two, they're outliers and they're scattered mm -hmm. in the main core, right? Um, And then once the distance becomes a little bit too big, then we can jump from one cluster to the other cluster. Um, and once it's a little bigger, we can we, we can jump from one to the other, and then so it's it doesn't completely solve the number of clusters, right? Um, But it does convert it from a global situation of trying to figure out how many clusters are to just how dense should be the dense, figuring out what the local density is. Um, and it works well in this, right? Because, I mean, yeah, I can, these are close enough until we get there and it, it's not going to jump over to. Um, yeah, as dimension gets higher and higher, um, so what this is an experiment where they took, uh, created sort of random points in space in different dimensions and then computed, right, the distance, every distance between points and, right, you know, there's the minimum distance and the maximum distance. And as you get more and more dimensions, right, they sort of converge, and so it's like they're all about the same. <laughs> now, for us humans, right, non mathematicians, 100 dimensions seems like it's like, really? But when you consider it's each independent variable of the dimension, um, then yeah, it's easy to get 10, 20, 30 dimensions, right? So, of course, then we have to reduce the number of dimensions, right? Um, and again, the idea is use number of places. Um, 
You, you may have hundred dimensions, but it may be that thirty of them already don't flood, you know give much variation to the data. So why don't we just drop them, right? Um, right. So when we look at this, right? This is you know two dimensional, but we transfer the axis, right? These things are all pretty close to right. Now the Y axis, so we can maybe just, you know, most of the variation now is on that one dimension. So if we just clap it, make it a one dimensional data, we lose some of the variation, but most of it is still preserved. Which leads us to the famous PCA algorithm. Um, So what it does is exactly what I did here. Um, it takes takes your data and then it starts mucking you, translating the data axis to figure out how can we rearrange the, act, the axis so that one dimension has the most variation. And then they have all the variation, but you know you, you just start rotating and well you don't do that, but you figure out you know where to place that axis to get it. The, so that one dimension has the most more variation than any other dimension, um, right? And then you can fix that, and then you can rearrange the other dimensions to get next one has the next highest variation, um, and you just do that for all the dimensions. And then when you're done, you just then you can say, well, okay, I'll just pick the first k dimensions. Hopefully, if we get enough variation of the data, and now <clears throat> we're not dealing with 100 dimensions, we're dealing with 20 dimensions. Um, now, a key point is to keep in mind is so, in this example, I rotate it right like this, um, <clears throat> and then I can you know, map all these the same, and then I can just use that axis, right? But we have to reassign the coordinates of the points to the new coordinate system, right? So then what happens is when you do PC analysis, it's going to transform all your data to a different coordinate system, right? By, again, doing all these transformations and then we give the remaining ones and so if you want once you've done your PC analysis now we can do a DB scan on this right but then to find out which point here refers to the original data set we have to do the undo that transformation um, Now this website actually does various nice examples. Of, um, right, so literally we can you know take this, translate it, and it becomes these points. And so they're all you know, so it, you know originally these are two dimensional and now this becomes like basically minus three and that becomes minus two, where was it here was um, here it was basically, I don't know, maybe two point something, two point something, right? And, and now it's, it's minus three, right? You do lose a little data. Yeah, you, you, you are losing information, yes. Okay. Right, absolutely. We do lose information. It makes it easier, right? You have less dimensions. You have less dimensions to do what? It's going to be easier to do the analysis. And so that's because the trade off is how much 
information I'm willing to lose, right, to do the analysis. Well, when you yeah, when when you do that PC analysis, the function will tell you, you know, you know, these number of act points will give you ninety eight percent of the information variation. And I guess depending on the number of points, you know, it looks like Right, and it depends what you're doing, right? It's um, when we look at those clusters, right? I mean, there's big variation in the cluster, and there's a few outliers, right? Um, yeah, you're okay, right? And it's again it depends what you're doing, right? If you're looking at Medical information, there's a lot of variation that you just can't account for, right? It's like, well, <clears throat> you know, I think the flu shot is like only like 70% defective, right? Like so you're at 70% already, right? Um, you know, so we, we can. Projected in different axes, different ways. Um, the projecting directly on the x and y is not as good as. <coughs> Where now, right, when we project it um, on the first axis, we get almost all of it, and then projecting the other axis, almost nothing, right? You know, so I generated again some fake data. Um, you know, it's clearly it's sort of a linear process, right? Um, and then using J, um, You know, look at the vector of two components um, and how much variation each axis, right? And so we're getting, you know, 76% of the variation of that data explained by the one axis now. Um, center of the data. Um, and, you know, then we get you know, these two axes. Why two dimensional variations together with the other? Where, where are the other? Are you just sure one is? Yeah, I'm only getting about seven or eight percent, right? The rest of them is kind of like a Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right, so we've got, you know, again, what's happening is that a lot of these algorithms are now, and then they're on Scott Can't Learn, they've been there for quite some time. Um, it's easy to compute the K means, the D scan, but the hard part becomes how many clusters, what should K be, you know, DB scan, what do we mean by close, and how many points, and how dense do we want those points. Um, and the data gets highly dimensional, we can use a PCA to 
to reduce it. You know, in this example, we have this crazy arc, right? We're not going to be able to, there's not going to be one axis that's going to explain much, so yeah, it becomes half and Now we just like draw those crazy vectors. And now a quick half moon and then like So again just like I said, a machine learning course and three lectures. Um, <laughs> now what you've all been waiting for, right? Um, Spark. Um, So it's, I started a project at Berkeley, um, 2009, um, you know, 2014, version 1 came out, um, so it's, depending on whether you account from the start of the project or the first real release, you know, it's either 6 years or 11 years old. Um, <clears throat> It's written in, sc in Scala, um, so if you if you want the most performant version of a program to run on Spark, it's going to be done written in Scala. Um, but they, you know, Scala compi compiles down to Java VM, so a Java program should be basically the same. It's just that. Um, you don't have some of the nice features in Java that you do in Scala, although that's improved recently with Java 8 to 9 and 10, and I think we're up to 13 now. Um, there's also an interface for Python and R. Um, the Python interface is, is much better than the R interface. Um, And you can also have an interactive shell, so you can actually you know, do the ripple where you type in a command and see it happens. Um, and it runs on Linux, Mac, and Windows. Um, the Windows, Windows support for Unix programs has been improving, um, so it's not as bad as it used to be. I don't have a Windows machine, so I haven't tested it. Um, There's, if you want to run on a cluster, you need, you need some software to manage a cluster to farm up the jobs and keep track of who's busy and what machine died. Um, so there's you know a bunch of them. Spark comes with their own cluster management, but Hadoop has their own uh, several. Um, there's various file systems they can work with. Um, and we can also run it on a single machine using a single file system. So whenever you develop a Spark program, you really want to do it on a single machine first. Um, and this course is going to be cheaper to, to debug on your laptop for free, except for your time, of course. Um, and then run it on AWS. To, um, this is becoming less important. Um, give you a time frame for why Hadoop and Spark are slightly different. Um, 
Well, Java started in 1991. Um, it was first released in 1995, so it's really getting old. Um, and Java 3 came out five years later. Um, Beta was started in 2001 as a reaction to Java being too verbose. Um, this program Nutch was started in 2002. Um, 2004, Google produced their famous map reduced paper, which explained how they were doing a lot of their searches to make them fast. Um, Scala 1 came out the same year. Um, following year, F Sharp was released. Um, 2006, Hadoop was split from um, Nutch. Um, Scala version 2 came out by then. Um, Closure was released in 2007. So we're getting more functional languages coming out. Um, in 2009, Spark <coughs> was started. Um, and there's several, th this time difference between um, 2002 or 2006 and 2009 is very significant um, for two big reasons. Um, one is memory prices plunge, right? Um, so when they started this pro project, uh, memory was extremely expensive, and so they wrote everything off the disk to save, conserve memory. Um, when Spark was started, it was clear that memory prices were just going to zero, and so it didn't make sense. So it made sense to assume that you're going to have lots and lots of memory. Um, so they started saying we're going to do, you know keep as long as possible keep everything in memory. And of course, that makes things much faster because you don't have to read it from disk and write that back and forth all the time. And the second difference is um, back in 2002, um, all the functional people were hiding in closets because if you said you weren't doing Java, people looked at you like you were some sort of strange alien. <laughs> creature that, you know, like, oh, I mean, what, really? You're not doing Java? You're not doing Java. Um, no one was willing to, very people admit they weren't doing Java work. Everyone did Java, right? Um, but this time, no, I mean, I mean, there's more and more functional, functional that start to come online. Um, so the second difference is the Spark project, you know, you know, it doesn't make sense to do what Hugoop did. Um, so Spark is far more functionally oriented than Hadoop. Um, and then Hadoop, you know, people were using Hadoop before this, but you know, version one came out. In 2014, version one of Spark came out. So even though these two dates are pretty close together, right? Um, the fact that one was started much earlier had a big impact on the decisions they made. Um, Okay, now, I'm going to sh hopefully show you why you never want to use Hadoop, right? And if someone wants you to Hadoop, you should just go away, and just walk away. Um, so, the classic, you know, every system has their whole world program, right? Um, in the Spark Hadoop world, it's, it's word count. And read a file in, count how many times each word occurs in the file, right? Um, so to do this in Hadoop, the first thing you need to do is you need, you only, you only got two operations you can do. You can do map and you can do reduce. That's it. So map and reduce. That's what Google said, map reduce. So that's what we're going to give you, map and reduce. And so you may have to do it multiple times, but you have to figure out how to make whatever you want to do fit in a map and reduce. Map reduce, map reduce, and then that's it, right? Um, and each map, you have to subclass mapper 
and writes um, one function called map. Um, and then you need to give it input. Um, and okay, so we're going to input this um, text value, and so okay, I need to convert it to a string. And now I'm going to tokenize it into a bunch of words. Um, and then what I'm going to do is um, let's see, word is a text object, and so I'm going to right. Um, put that my token into the word and then I'm going to write it out to the context right right um, so now I've taken this one big file or and spread out the pieces and run it out to text file right now we need reduce um, we got this interval so we can all the values and our context thing, we can write things out to. Um, and now I can just like, write a for loop, right? Where I iterate over all the interval items and then compute the sum, right? And now I'm going to, but each key now is a separate word, right? So I'm only getting all the words that associated with that key, um, and I write that out. We're not done yet. Now we need to write a driver program to run the whole thing. Um, and so we get a main, we have to configure it and give it a name, and we have to, you know, set the output. It's going to be a, a text type and Right, the input would be this, and then what's our mapper class, what's our reducer class, and I could format the input and the output. Um, right, and then where the output's going to go, and then we have to wait for it to complete. Using five, you know. Spark using Python. Um, uh, we have some imports. Um, you know, the standard sort of Python. Look, you guys, you need to give me two arguments, otherwise I can't run. Um, and I then have to get what they call a Spark session, which allows us to do various things. And so now I'm going to. Well, I'm going to read the argument and convert it into a um, RDR with each row being a line. And now I can um, apply a well, flat map to split it into my faces. And then I can um, map um, each word into a tuple. Right? That's my key and the value in the Dupe world, and now what happens is each I get a whole long list of tuples, you know, the word and one, word and one, and now I'm going to um, reduce by key. So I'm going to take every key that's the same and then add their counts together, right? And we do it over and over again. And when we're done, um, we have a list of tuples, a word, and the total count. And then we, we're going to save that as a file someplace, and then I'm done. You don't want any use to do. The Java version, um, the bit more robust, um, a bit more understandable. Again, we're getting what the Spark session we need. We're definitely reading the file, right? 
and then I can burn it to an RDD, um, which I'll talk about later. And now I'm getting words, and now I'm mapping to pairs. And once I got the pairs, I can now count them all up to, to and then I'll put the output. Right. Scala. It's written in Scala, right? And Scala is written to take care of the verbosity of Java, um, and it's far more functional. And so again, it's like, okay, I need a session, I read the file, and oh, okay, now I'm applying a map, flat map. Okay, flat. What does this do? Well, map, we're going to apply it, we'll apply that function over all the items, right? Um, but a flat map then flattens it all out so we don't have a structure of a structure. Um, right? And now that is piped into another map. So now I'm, I'm basically getting words. And I then map each word into a tuple, a word, and count one. And then I reduce by key, meaning give me all the same things with a key. And now I'm going to apply add. So I'm going to add up all the values. Now I'm done. So did, did you try to make this basically how they spell Java would try to make it you know, Java to be on the like Probably. Yeah, have to remember, right? Okay. We're, we're at the height of Java world, right? We're, now at height of Java, but we're also height of Obi-Wan programming, so everything's a class, right? And if you're doing this in Java, it, you don't have, all you have is classes and methods, right? You don't have lambdas back then. It was all, it's all I could do, right? So once you've picked Java, once you're in that mindset, everything is a class. And if you're going to apply a map reduce, you need to do, you need to, in Java, you need a method that does map and method to reduce. How do you do that? Well, you have to have a class. And so they have a parent class for each one. Um, that's just, to, yeah, I mean, if you're, if you're doing pure object-oriented programming and you're in Java, that's it. That's all you have. Um, by the time Spark came around, you know, functional programming was becoming trendy. You have to remember this is at Berkeley, right? And so they were in the center of all the trends, and so they were years ahead of everyone else. Like, oh, functional programming is good. Um, whereas 2000, it was like bad. I mean, who's going to do that? Um, now, there are two major parts to a dupe. One is um, the math reduce system. Right, and that's that's what you interface with. The second part is the Hadoop file system, um, and Spark uses that. Like you want a distributed file, Hadoop distributed file system. Spark needed a distributed file system because you were going to put this on a cluster, right? And so you need that. And so why rewrite the file system? So. They, they use that, and so it's there, right? But again, if you if you go to AWS, they don't use the Duke file system. They use their own S3. Now, one thing to keep in mind is, you know, if you're on Spark and you're writing in Java, well, it compiles the bytecode, and it's all the same VM, right? No Spark. Um, when you're writing Python, Python is not a JVM language, right? So your program's here, and Spark is here, and if data is here, it has to get over there, and so you have to, you have to take this data and serialize it in some way that can be sent from one process to another process and deserialized here, into Spark data and perform, and then you get the answer reverse process, right? Um, 
So if you're going to read, you know, a hundred gigabyte file in Python and ship it to Spark, you're dead, right? You get to, and so it's been a very good job. Um, one of they wrote a high performance serialization back and forth, and also they did they did clever things like well when you think you're reading a file in Python, no, it's going to actually do it over here because it's just going to be more efficient. Um, so there is some efficiency lost using Python, um, and if you do things the wrong way and you really balancing back and forth, you can really slow it down. Um, but it's not too, too bad. I mean, it, I taught this course once using scale, and the problem is scale is great for doing it on Spark, but for any analysis, terrible. I mean, it's awkward. So next week, we'll look at how to install Spark on your machine and get started with.